Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, am your host, Simon Wimacy. One of my writers, in this case, Katie. Thank you, Katie. It's written me a script. It's the Shag Harbor UFO event. <laughs> shag Harbor. Shag is a word. Do Americans have the word shag? It's like, uh, it always reminds me of Austin Powers. It's like, shagadelic, baby. <laughs> um, it means to have sex. <gasps> Before we get started, I just wanted to get this out of the way. The name of the place that we're going to talk about today is Shag Harbor. While it's supposedly named after a bird, it's still pretty funny to anyone who's over 10. So Shag, 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 Shag. Is it less funny now? <laughs> Probably not, but at least we tried. Actually, this reminded me of a photo from a long time ago. I went to Hilton Head in South Carolina and took a photo of a poster advertising Friday Shag Night. 5 to 10 p.m. <laughs> this is it. What? what? Unfortunately, he left on Friday morning, so he didn't get to experience it. I assume it was referring to the Carolina Shag, a dance, and not some local orgy, although I guess I'll never find out now. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, Shag Night. Hmm. <laughs> Shag Harbor is a small fishing community on the southern end of the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. Apart from the funny name, it has one other claim to fame, and that's being the site of the only government-recognized UFO sighting in Canada, and maybe the world. Yes, you heard that right, folks. So do we have a bona fide extraterrestrial episode on our hands? Well, let's get into it. Let me guess. No, because UFO, as I've said many times, just stands for unidentified flying object. And by the way, the correct pronunciation of it is UFO, apparently, like from the guy who came up with it. But let's not do that because it's wrong. Um, it's just it just means that the government were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, maybe it was an American spy plane or whatever. And the Canadians like, oh, we don't know what that is. And so it's a, it's a UFO. Boom. Done. Easy. Episode done. <laughs> No, not really. We've got many pages left to go. Just before we continue with today's episode, let me thank today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Look, if you ever face the urban jungle on a rainy day dodging puddles, well, no more with today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Not only are their shoes very stylish, but they're also 100% waterproof, and that's not water resistant. Like you see, oh yeah, water resistant. So it keeps my feet like a little bit dry. No, no, no. Vessi's are waterproof using something called Dymatex. So basically, up until here they've even got this little seal in here so uh water can come like all the way up here and your feet will remain totally dry and so yeah no chance for puddles they've got a bunch of different shoes this is the altar i recently wore this on a trip to iceland and when it snows outside i put these bad boys on they've got this fantastic uh sort of like wool but i know these are vegan so i guess oh wool can be can be used <laughs> how does vegan work look i don't know what it is but it's extremely comfortable they've also got these kind of more classic shoes they've got these soho got this like leather on the outside vegan leather but like i say keeps your feet 100 percent dry while looking very stylish i never showed these shoes but people got a kick out of it last time because people were like how do we know you actually wear this simon because i wore these for two years and the bottoms are extremely warm worn they are still waterproof uh, but yeah, just uh, two years, basically solid wearing constantly. Plus, they've also got their overcast jacket. They've got gloves. They've got all sorts of stuff. So you can discover their latest collection at vessi.com forward slash unknown. Get your pair today and uh, you'll be absolutely sorted. One of my favorite sponsors. Couldn't recommend it more. Vessi.com forward slash unknown. You get 15% off your first purchase and you've got free shipping to Canada, the US, Australia, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea and Singapore. So don't worry about weather get some Bessies, and now back to today's episode. The events as reported in 1967. For this story, we have to go way back to the 4th of October 1967. Apparently, the box tops were riding the top of the Billboard 100 with their song called The Letter, which I've never heard of, but at least it doesn't sound as bad as the number one song a few weeks later, which was Incense and Peppermints by the way, which happens to be by one of the bands with the worst name ever, Strawberry Alarm Clock. Oh my god, what was, what was going on in the 60s? Too many drugs! I love drugs. Although it makes them very easy to find online, and apparently they're still going in some shape or form, so good for you. It's like 50 years later. Why are you guys, how are you not, I suppose if they were like 20 and doing a band, they'd still be like 70. How old's Mick Jagger? Hey Siri, how old is Mick Jagger? Mick Jagger is 80 years old, and my parents went to see the Rolling Stones go and perform, like, recently. And they were like, Mick Jagger is intense. Like, he's still, like, running around the stage, he still can sing. Apparently, he's just, like, absolutely still, like, rocking the 
out of the Rolling Stones. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> good for you, Mick. It's all that healthy living, isn't it, Mick? Anyway, folks around the normally sleepy area of Shag Harbor had a more exciting night than usual this particular October evening. Teenager Laurie Wickens was driving a carload of his friends back to Shag Harbor on the 4th when they spotted some strange lights in the sky. In a Canadian press story on the National Post website, he's quoted as saying, There were four in a row, and they were going on and off. One would come on, then two, three, and four, and they'd all be off for a second and come back on again. They had the impression that the lights were part of one object, which seemed to be heading down at a 45 degree angle towards the water. They couldn't see exactly what happened next, as the curves on the road that they were driving on meant that the object went out of view for a short time, but Wickens and other passengers reported hearing a whooshing or whistling noise. When they could see it again, or where they thought the trajectory of the object was headed, there was a large yellow light floating on the water. Sure that they had witnessed a plane ditching into the sea, the teens drove to find a phone box and called the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Canada's National Police Service. Oh! I can't believe I'm just finding this out now, but I always thought like the RCMP, like the, the Mounties, the, the police on horses, was just like a special branch of like the police for like crowd control or something, you know, when police get on horses, that kind of shit. Apparently, it's just like the National Police Service. They're not all on horses, though, right? That's just that this gotta just be the name. <laughs> not be a Every police officer has a horse. At about the same time, another car with a couple of teens in it also spotted four or five glowing lights headed down at the same 45 degree angle. One of these teens, Norm Smith, also later reported hearing the whistling sound. He could still see the lights by the time he got home, and also fearing that there was an aircraft in distress, Smith, his dad, and his uncle rushed down to Shag Harbor to see if they could help. The RCMP officer, who took Laurie Wickens' call, was initially skeptic about the teen's report of a possible plane crash, but as more calls started to come in from at least seven other people also speaking of the whistling noise and the yellow-orange lights, he decided to start taking it seriously. <laughs> Why would you not take it seriously? Who's like, is it, I as a prank call, I'm just pranking the police that there's been a plane crash. Why would you do that? I mean, I'm sure some psychos do, but it's like, just take it seriously. It's a plane crash. Just like, I don't know, there's probably a button you can press. These little contacts like, air traffic control or whatever i mean like guys guys what's up anything any any planes gone missing <laughs> any crashes into the sea can i wrap this one up or you know tell me the crowd started to grow as people got curious about what all the commotion was and they all witnessed a yellow light floating about 200 meters off the shore which seemed to be part of an object about 60 feet or 18 meters across the light then seemed to dim and slip under the water at about 11:20 p.m and disappear Shortly after the light vanished, a search and rescue attempt was made. The RCMP officers, the Smith family, and other volunteers headed out to the apparent crash site in two fishing boats, trying to see if there were any survivors. They didn't find debris, bodies, or any other evidence of a crash plane. What they did find, however, was a large swath of thick yellow foam on the surface of the water, judged to cover an area of about 80 feet by half a mile or about 25 by 800 meters. That's very large. It was thick, glistening, and smelled of sulfur. None of the fishermen had ever seen anything like it, and it wasn't just oil or fuel. A couple more local boats joined the search, with the Coast Guard arriving at about half past midnight. The initial search was called off at 4 a.m. on the 5th of October. During this time, the RCC, or Rescue, Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, had been contacted for any information on missing aircraft in the area. As the hours went by, it was confirmed that there were no missing commercial, domestic, or military aircraft, and the RCMP officers were also pretty sure that they had, there hadn't been a plane crash as the area was not very deep and they were sure would have been sure to have found some debris after hours of searching. By 10.30 a.m. on the 5th of October, the mystery object was being referred to as a UFO by the Rescue Coordination Center, which is entirely accurate, because it's like, well, we don't know what it is, so it's unidentified. Was it flying? Yes. Is it an object? Well, that's an easy one. It's a UFO. That doesn't mean it's aliens. The search resumed on the 6th of October, bolstered by a team of divers, and according to a slightly dubious-sounding website, roswellproof.com <laughs> Yeah, roswellproof.com, it's like, uh, you know it's gonna be biased. Uh, quoting them though, By the process of elimination, RCMP, RCC, and the air desk in Ottawa were all now tagging the object as a UFO. Now, yes, this website name does sound a bit biased, but, well, this is actually what happens. Well, good for you, roswelltruth.com. A uh, proof.com, sorry. As it was the authorities and government departments that first started bandying the UFO label around, and not the people who saw it from their homes, cars, or boats. This added an extra layer of credibility to the event. 
A memo between departments said, quote, A preliminary investigation has been carried out by the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax. It has been determined that this UFO sighting was not caused by a flare, float, aircraft, or in fact any known object. On the 7th of October, the Chronicle Herald ran a front page piece with the headline stating, could be something concrete in Shag Harbor UFO. RCF continue search today. <laughs> I love re- I don't know why I like reading the, like the old newspaper announcers. Like, could be something concrete in Shag Harbor UFO. Like, why do they all speak so weird? The RCAF is the Royal Canadian Air Force, by the way. I, I, oh, okay, Royal Canadian Air. That makes sense. Yeah, we have the RAF in the UK, which is the Royal Air Force. RUCAF would have it if it's the Royal United Kingdom Air Force, which is unnecessary because. <laughs> Just, you don't, we know what the RAF is. Other news articles soon followed with titles such as There is something down there. The search was eventually halted on the 9th of October 1967, with the Navy being quoted in the Chronicle Herald as having found not a trace, not a clue, not a bit of anything. Mysterious, eh? As Don Ledger, co author of Dark Object, puts it, something came out of the sky and went into the water at Shag Harbor, and nobody knew what it was. Well, Don! bang on i mean yes everyone's correct it's ufos it's mysterious objects and i don't know who's like it's aliens rather than like oh it's uh it's classified military aircraft or something like that or a weather balloon or something because it just it's, it's just much more likely to be that like infinitely more likely other corroborating events it wasn't just those handful of people around shag harbor that witnessed these lights calls and reports to various organizations around nova scotia that night and in the days that followed the supposed crash created a fuller timeline of the events here are just a few examples. At 7.15 p.m. on the 4th, Air Canada Flight 305 was flying from Halifax to Toronto through clear skies. Captain Pierre Charbonneau and co-pilot Robert Ralph both saw a well-lit rectangular object flying on a parallel course to them, with what looked like a string of smaller lights trailing behind it. They then saw an apparent explosion followed by another, with one glowing cloud heading east, while the smaller lights seemed to act independently around the area of the first explosion. Both pilots allegedly provided full written reports of this incident. At around 9 p.m., fishermen on the MV Nickerson contacted the Halifax Harbour Master to inquire about some weird objects that had shown up on their radar. They reported red flashing lights in the shape of a large box that would flash so brightly as to leave an afterimage. Eventually, only one light remained that flew straight up in the air, went over the fishing boat, and headed in the direction of Shag Harbor. There were apparently no naval exercises going on at the time. Yes, but I mean, for the government to be like there were no naval exercises, well, let's assume that's the Canadian government, right? And even if it was the Canadians conducting, like, secret tests, they're going to be like, nope, nothing was happening. Definitely not a crash of an experimental aircraft, and anyone who was in the aircraft died in a training exercise. And, he, and, and that's just assuming it was Canada. If it's the Americans, they're going to be even more silent, because they're probably, like, illegally or I suppose they're allies, or whatever, but, like, flying uh, experimental aircraft. Because America's right next door, and they're always... they got loads of experimental aircraft and cool shit. So, they're not going to admit to it. They're just going to be like, nope, nothing. Nothing happens. At 10 p.m. in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, 12-year-old Chris Stiles saw a large, round, glowing object heading along the harbor. He rushed out of his house with some binoculars to investigate and saw that it was about 50 to 60 feet or 15 to 18 meters in diameter. It came within about 100 feet or 30 meters of the shoreline before Chris got really scared and ran home. His grandfather called him the next day to tell him about the incident at Shag Harbor, which was about 150 miles away, and Chris realized that he might have seen the same phenomenon. At about 10.30 p.m. in Mason's Beach, Nova Scotia, Will Eisner spotted three lights in a triangle formation. As they didn't move for a while, and he was a photographer, he managed to take a five-minute exposure of the lights before they eventually disappeared. It shows some streaks of red light and some static lights, a large purple one with a bluish outline, a medium-sized red one, and a small, clear, bright orange one. The red streak, you'll see it on the screen now. I'm also looking at it out on my documents. It's just some blurry... I don't... Uh, <laughs> It's just never that convincing, is it? The photographs, you're like, it could be anything. It could be anything. The red streaks are explained as stars due to the movement of the planet during the exposure time. The static lights couldn't be planes or helicopters, for example, as they wouldn't have been able to remain stationary for the amount of time that the camera took without appearing far more blurry. 
The photo was taken about an hour before the reported crash at Shag Harbor, and while some people, such as Dark Object co-author Don Ledger, don't necessarily believe it was the object witnessed falling toward the water later that night, it does prove to him at least that there were other unexplained lights in the sky that night. Exactly a week later, another strange sight was witnessed not far from the Shag Harbor area by the Cameron family. Here's the report that was submitted to the RCMP at the time. To quote, Light in straight line, southeast direction, and 45 degree angle. No form seen. Estimated spread of light to be 50 to 60 feet. On four occasions, the lights which were bright red and as bright as local boy lights went off in sequence from back to front and there were lit in sequence from front to back. The first time, there were six lights and the last time four. Lights hovering and shifting from side to side. Red lights watched for seven to eight minutes and were extinguished and yellow-orange light appeared and disappeared over the horizon to the northwest. This light was observed for approximately 10 minutes, all persons sober and appear to be sincere. Sighting also reported to RAF Bakaro. Understand Bakaro radar negative. No known operations in area suggest government personnel interview persons concerned above and those in sighting on 4th October 1967. The quote ends. This sighting garnered another flurry of press attention with an article titled, Canadian Defense Department Investigates UFO That Dived Into Nova Scotia Bay. This appeared shortly after, but as nothing was found, the interest in the Shag Harbor UFO soon died away and was more or less forgotten, until one day, 25 years later, when one of the original witnesses was all grown up and started to do some digging. Later Revelations Remember Chris Stiles? Nope. <laughs> Wait, was he the kid who ran down and then was scared and went to get his granddad? He was the 12-year-old who rushed out of the house, there we go, uh, to see the orange light hovering near the harbor. Well, in the early 90s, he happened to watch a program about Roswell, and his memory of the lights at Shag Harbor came flooding back. According to the documentary The Shag Harbor UFO Incident, quote, From that moment, Shag Harbor became an obsession with him. Chris himself states, The Shag Harbor Incident is unique in that it's one of the cases that the more data you learn, the more witnesses, the more documentation, this case does not evaporate. The more you learn, the stronger it gets in terms of its unconventional reality. The quote ends. Now, once his investigation had got underway, Stiles was joined by Don Ledger, who was also interested in the case, although in a slightly more pragmatic way. Stiles went to the Canadian National Archives to search old military records and found a cache of UFO sightings on microfilm dating back to the 1940s. He also found old telex communications between Ottawa and Nova Scotia, telex basically being text messages sent over an exchange and printed out at the other end. Oh, is this like what people did before telephones? <laughs> I thought it was called telegram. I thought it was a telegram. Okay, never mind. There were plenty regarding the Shag Harbor incident, most marked with a priority stamp and littered with references to lights, dark objects, and flying objects, as well as using the acronym UFO in these messages. Some printouts also had margin notes, such as someone handwriting UFO on top of one report and underlining it three times. Stiles says, I've often said I don't know if what's responsible here is extraterrestrial, extratemporal, or extradimensional. Dude. <laughs> Whenever anyone's like saying these words, it, they're just like, they're such pseudoscience words. But it was certainly unconventional, and I think they ran with that premise in Ottawa, and I think that the priority and the tone of these documents speaks loudly that they were dealing with something potentially extraterrestrial. Does it really? I, I have seen no evidence of that so far. It's just like they don't know what it was. I, I mean, I didn't read all those old telex reports or anything, but... So far, it just seems like any government communication has just been like, yeah, it's a UFO. It's an unidentified flying object. It's probably those f Americans and their spy planes. <laughs> Stiles and Ledger then went to visit the National Department of Defense Station at Barrington, about 13 miles away from Shag Harbor. It was operating with radar detection at the time, so presumably it would have picked up anything flying around in the area. The official word, however, was that nothing was picked up. Would the military really give out any information of an alien nature, though? Surely they'd want to keep any information about potential extraterrestrial technology out of the hands of mere mortals. Saying that, it does seem odd that absolutely nothing was picked up, as plenty of people saw lights in the sky heading downward, then saw them in the water afterward. There was a large public search, with members of the RCMP stating that they thought it was an alien UFO when asked by members of the public if they had found anything. Yeah, but they're just coppers. They're just coppers searching for things. They're like, no, I think it's aliens. It's like, well, okay, brilliant. I'm glad you think it's aliens, cop. But that's that, that doesn't mean anything. That something was there doesn't appear to be in doubt. They just didn't find anything afterwards. Or 
They said they didn't find anything. Checking into the story, 25 years on, Stiles found an apparent whistleblower from Barrington who said that the radar had picked up something that night, but they'd all been sworn to secrecy. Apparently, whatever the object was, it entered the airspace in northwestern Canada and wobbled through the atmosphere before eventually crash landing in Shag Harbor. Then the source stated that there was a second object following it and that after the incident at Shag Harbor, both objects had then moved. The theory of two UFOs ties back in with the later witness sighting by the Cameron family of an unidentified string of lights a week after the original crash. An article from the Chronicle Herald on the 12th of October 1967 about this sighting states, Second UFO reported seen in Shelburne. After talking to more retired military personnel, Stars uncovered that one UFO crashed or submerged under the water and then moved up the coast to Shelburne while the original dive team was still combing Shag Harbor. A second UFO joined it and they eventually moved further along the coast or out to sea before they then both flew out of the water and disappeared. Is it a coincidence that the direction they were supposed to be traveling in under the water led them directly to the vicinity of what was at the time a secret military base about 30 miles away? Oh look, a secret military base enters the chat. What a surprise! Canadian Forces Station, CFS Shelburne, was a joint Canadian-American military base that at the time of the Shag Harbor events was ostensibly an oceanographic research base but in reality was acting as a secret Cold War submarine tracking station. Yeah. It's these dudes. It's the Americans and the Canadians, and they're testing out some secret spy. <laughs> this means there was a magnetic grid laid out in the area that would detect heavy metal vessels, and the base also was constantly monitoring a network of underwater microphones that were laid out all over the Atlantic. Basically, if these UFOs traveled anywhere in its vicinity, it should have some record of them. And according to Stiles, it did. It allegedly picked up this object resting a few miles away near the seafloor and a fleet of ships and aircraft were dispatched to check it out. Divers made many visits around the object over the course of the next week, saying that it looked like the first object was being assisted by the second. According to Stiles, one of the phrases he remembers being told by a diver is, there was still activity going on down there. He was told that there were things seen that weren't from here. This particular source felt uneasy, giving away any more information as he wasn't supposed to talk about it. Don Ledger said that they had talked to other people involved who had also said that they did not wish to be filmed or identified as they were wary of some sort of reprisal. Some of the military personnel involved were under the impression that they were monitoring a Soviet submarine, but others were adamant that it was nothing they'd seen before. At the end of the week-long vigil, the real Soviet sub entered the picture, causing the ships to reconfigure. The UFOs apparently used this window to move off under the water before eventually breaking the surface and taking to the skies once more. Possible Explanations Okay, we've heard the story with the whole extraterrestrial angle, and there's just nothing there. There's really nothing there. It's just people thinking it's aliens because they can't explain it. But that's not what it is. It's explainable by something else, something much more terrestrial. So let's see if we can work some rationality into it. I guess the biggest point against the whole alien UFO thing is that there is no physical evidence. If something did go into the water at Shag Harbor, there is no trace of it. People, including perceived trustworthy witnesses such as police, saw lights in the sky acting in such a way that many thought was a plane coming down. But could there be another explanation? I had to turn to Brian Dunning and Skeptoid. Oh, it's always a nice DTU when Brian Dunning and Skeptoid enter the picture. And as usual, his observations are clear and cut through most of the noise. He mentions that while there were other UFO sightings before and after this one, all these put together may just confuse the whole matter with witnesses tying events together erroneously or changing their stories to match what other people had already said and just the general passage of time changing their stories in some way. There weren't many matching stories at the time either. In newspaper articles published right after the event, we have various numbers of colors of lights flashing or not flashing, noises or no noises. As Dunning puts it on Skeptoid.com, quoting, A pair of teens reported three reddish-orange lights descending, each appearing in order, forming a line declining at about 45 degrees, but then their car drove out of view. Four other teens saw the same thing, but got the number at four instead of three and called them yellow or white and watched them descend gracefully all the way down to the water. One of these said he remembered them turn off and back on, but the others did not. One person said he heard them making a whistling noise, the others did not. Another person said that they heard a loud noise when they hit the water, but nobody else reported this either. So all we can say from taking these witness accounts as a whole is that a small number of bright lights were seen to descend toward the water where one remained floating for a short time. The quote ends. 
Now this already seems to take the wind out of E.T. sails, but let's carry on. The wind was never in E.T. sails! The only tangible thing that the UFO did leave behind was this weird yellow foam, although none of it was apparently tested, or the results were never made public, so we don't know what it was. Was this even related to the lights, though? Again, according to Dunning, the light that a few people had seen floating became connected with the foam reported by a fisherman later that night, and now accounts read that they saw the floating light moving around, leaving yellow foam. In fact, nobody reported seeing this at the time. Yeah, the yellow foam is just like nasty, like sea scum or whatever, you know, you get that like weird. You sometimes get this, like in the corner of a harbor or whatever, you get this like weird foamy sh. It's like, ugh, what is that? And it's this. So, time changes everyone's story and their memories of the event. So, how about the later stuff relating to two UFOs hanging out near a secret submarine detection base for repairs? While this seems like a great ending to the story, the whole thing seems to be a bit suspect. Why didn't anyone do very much if they were observing them for a week? If the divers were placing microphones and cameras, as one said they were, was any footage recovered? Why did the UFOs decide to head there in particular? Is there any proof that this whole bit even happened? While Chris Sykes and Don Ledger present this whole epilogue to the Shag Harbor event in their book Dark Objects, the world's only government-documented UFO crash, there is no actual evidence that any of it happened. They allegedly talked to military personnel that were allegedly there at the time, but handily none of those sources wanted to be identified and only spoke around the event, not elaborating on the things that they'd seen. Is the Canadian government so threatening that even 25 years later, all the people involved were still afraid to speak out about it? Basically, because of a lack of clarity around these sources and the events at Shelburne, we can't say for sure if this entire section was just made up or not. So. Do we have any idea for what people might have been seeing that night? Now, one of the obvious candidates would be some kind of military experiment. Yes, however, Dunning blasts that theory straight out of the sky. Nice. He says, This has always been a terrible explanation. Oh no! It was but it's it might be a terrible explanation, Brian, but it's still infinitely more likely than aliens as it fails at plain logic on at least two points. First, top-secret military aircraft have never been flown in plain view of civilians at low altitude, directly over population centers far from test facilities, and there's every reason to believe that this would never be done. Second, flying sources or rows of lights reported by UFO witnesses have never corresponded to the properties of any military aircraft, so there's no logic that can support such a match. I, I, I agree with Brian, but I'm also like, yeah, secret military aircraft, that they're, they're, they're secret though. You don't know about them top secret maybe it was maybe they did have this i mean i don't think so I, I imagine there's something like i imagine there's another simpler explanation let's see what it is well color me sheepish mr dunning as that's usually my go-to explanation for all ufo stuff covered on this channel so far i'll bear it in mind for future episodes <laughs> yeah but it's still more reasonable than aliens because experimental secret military tech exists Aliens visiting Earth doesn't. Could it have been some sort of atmospheric event like a meteor exploding or a meteor shower or something? The lights and angles might match up, but you would have thought that with all the first-hand witnesses there, someone would have thought of this possibility and most people were convinced they were looking at some kind of craft, not a shooting star or whatever. A good candidate might be military flares. Yes, I know the memo said it was determined this UFO sighting had not been caused by a flare, amongst other things, but it does not say how they determined this. Maybe it wasn't the military dropping them, maybe it was a mistake, a different country doing it, or just a random group of kids. 1967 was not only the swinging 60s, it was also right in the middle of the Cold War and the space race. According, yeah, 1960s, there's got to be so much secret shit flying around. We know there was, because a lot of it's been declassified. But... There's probably still stuff that was going on that we just don't know about. According to the National Post article, on the 50th anniversary of the Shag Harbor incident, quote, Russian submarines were known to frequent the East Coast, and the Americans were testing all manner of devices to spy on their communist foes, including crude spy satellites that ejected film canisters at high altitudes. So yes, random earthly things falling from the sky was not outside the realm of possibility, and if it landed in a shallow body of water with a strong current, like Shag Harbor, any debris might be long gone by the time the boats got to where they thought the light had been. And if they didn't know what they were looking for, that would have made recognizing anything even more difficult. Anyway, back to the flares. 
While these are often poo-pooed, some types of flare can last longer and burn brighter than the average civilian realizes. Check out the episode on the Phoenix Lights for a pretty comprehensive look at how flares could account for at least one event that night, although I guess that was a massive spoiler. Sorry. <laughs> no one's watching DTE being like, this is the one! This is the one where it's not ruined by Simon and it is aliens! It's like, no, you watch this channel because we ruin stuff. That's the whole thing. It's decoded, and by decoded, I mean ruined. Flares also descend like these shag harbor lights and may remain visible on the water for some time. Dunning posits that maybe the flares caused the foam, although he found no evidence of what flares might do after they go out on water, but hey, it's as likely a theory as a UFO causing the foam if the foam has anything to do with the story at all, which I don't think it does, and it's not as likely, it's far more likely. <laughs> Even if flares have never been known to do this, it's still more likely. <laughs> because no evidence of anything was found, and we have no other confirmed UFO sightings or actual alien craft to compare it to, we can't really say that the lights seen at Shag Harbor were of extraterrestrial real origin. Of course, we can't say with 100% certainty that uh, they were just something like a flare going off, but we should probably try and discount all the boring earthly probabilities first before seeking answers from the stars. Yes, but people don't like to do that. I assume because it's boring, but it's like, yeah, well, conspiracy theories are just like usually. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's probably just the boring thing. Like 9-11, oh, it's an inside job. <laughs> Those buildings are going to collapse just from planes, and it's like, yo, a off giant plane hit a building. Yeah. Bro, they did, is the boring answer. What about the photo that Will Eisner took? Well, it showed some bright lights that were apparently stationary for at least the five minutes the camera shutter was open, but these could have been something like a faraway meteor shower, maybe. The lights don't really match any of the descriptions given by eyewitnesses, so maybe they are yet another separate event that's been bundled into the main narrative. Some people have pointed to a cover-up by the Canadian government, given that a full governmental investigation was never, ca never carried out or it was kept under wraps. What has been made public, though, is the report from Dr. Norman Levine, who investigated on behalf of what was known as the Condong Committee, and was but was officially called the University of Colorado UFO Project, which was funded by the U.S. Air Force from 1966 to 1968, handily bookending the year the Shag Harbor event happened. He laid out some eyewitness accounts, but did inject a note of cynicism regarding the fisherman's testimony of a light going up into the sky. In the report, he states, The ship's radar showed four objects forming a six-mile square. The three lights were associated with one of these objects. At about 11 p.m., one of the lights went straight up. The captain had judged that the radar objects were naval vessels and the ascending light a helicopter. He had attached no significance to these observations until he heard on the radio of the sightings. He then reported the foregoing observations to the RCMP. However, since the position he reported for the objects was about 175 nautical miles from the original site, the two situations do not appear to be related. See, the fisherman didn't think anything weird was afoot with what he saw until it was later put into the context of a possible UFO sighting. Yeah, and then this is just so... It, your memories, they get muddled so easily, as we've talked about like so many times. Overall, Levine didn't see overly impressed with any of the details, concluding, quote, No further investigation by the project was considered justifiable, particularly in view of the immediate and thorough search that had been carried out by the RCMP and the Maritime Command. The Shag Harbor event lives on. We've already mentioned the book written about the Shag Harbor event, but you may not be surprised to hear that they're really milking this puppy for all it's worth. Actually, I'll give you the full title of the book as it really sets its stall out. Dark Object, the world's only government-documented UFO crash. The facts confirm the crash happened. Officials deny it. What don't they want us to know? What a bloody long-ass title. You really fit that onto the cover of a book. Moving on, did you know that there is a Shag Harbor UFO Incident Society, the president of which is none other than Laurie Wickens of Teenager in a Car Who Phoned the RMCP fame? They're based at the Shag Harbor UFO Interpretive Center, a yellow building filled with alien bits and bobs and framed newspaper articles of the 1967 event. How did you pay for this? <laughs> Who's giving you money? While some people were trying to turn the place into a Roswell-type tourist trap, it hasn't really happened, but being in Canada, it's got a sweet charm all its own. Outside the interpretive center, there's a big flashy sign saying crash site of the 1967 Shag Harbor UFO with a flying saucer on it. Although the object was never referred to as a saucer at the time, there's also a statue of an archetypal green alien wearing a lobster suit. <laughs> I see, I got a picture of it. Why is this a thing? I guess because they have a lot of lobsters there, maybe? There was even a Shag Harbor event stamp commissioned in 2001 and a commemorative coin issued in 2019, which has cool glow-in-the-dark features. 
Nova Scotian brewery Boxing Rock also has a Shag Harbor UFO Blonde Ale, which is, according to them anyway, out of this world crisp and refreshing. <laughs> but wait, there's more. There's an annual Shag Harbor UFO Expo in Nova Scotia. This year it was a two-day event in fe featuring various speakers, including Chris Stiles and even Travis Walton, the guy who was abducted by aliens. No, he wasn't! <laughs> There's a video about him on this channel too somewhere, but someone else wrote that one, so I don't exactly know how much credibility he ended up getting. Probably little to zero. Yeah, he got zero. Is this the guy who was in the woods chopping trees and this happens? He's like, no, I absolutely did not believe it at all. While it is true that the official communications between various departments in Canada are calling the Shag Harbor object a UFO, and people like the RS RCMP officers and some military divers were using this in, their ex in the extraterrestrial context, whether this was actually an alien vessel is still up for debate. But the likelihood is that it wasn't. Sorry, Canada. Sorry, not sorry. It's not a UFO. Relax, everybody. It's just some weird lights in the sky. Can we explain it? No. Do we need to explain? Do we need to prove that it's you, you, not that it's not a UFO? No. No. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show, leave a rating or subscribe on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.